Hello friends. So today's video is going to be an if you like this, try that, specifically for if you like A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Mass. Here are some other books that you might be interested in checking out. Of course, people love books for different reasons. With Akatar in particular, for some of you, it's that you love the hybrid of both fantasy and romance. Some of you, it's the writing style. For some, it's the incorporation of Fae, maybe it's the plot lines. So I wanted to ensure that there is something for everybody on this list. It's not any one of those things, but a mix of those things. I'm going to start with the books that have plot lines that sound almost identical to Akatar, and those books would be An Enchantment of Ravens, Guild for the Wolf, and These Hollow Vows. I'm going to start with An Enchantment of Ravens. This is one that I think it being so similar to A Court of Thorns and Roses actually ended up hurting it because a lot of people went into it expecting it to be just like that or frustrated that the premise was so similar. We follow a young woman who is living within the human world, but the part of the human world she is living in is right up against the Fey world. And so they actually interact with the Fey fairly often. Our main character has this very strong talent when it comes to painting, similar to how Feyre does in Akatar, but it is so much a part of this character's life. And there is one man in particular who comes over who she paints quite often, and they build this relationship. And because she is such a gifted painter, she really is great at depicting the emotions of the characters or the people that she is painting. And when the Fae ends up taking the painting back and goes to show it to his whole court, the first time he's showing it to everyone, they see vulnerability painted on his face, and then suddenly his leadership is put into question because it's very important among the Fae that you don't have these vulnerabilities. This Fae royal ends up bringing her back to the Fae world to sort of explain herself because now he believes that his enemies have put her up to this to try and weaken his hold on his throne. And so she's sort of thrust into these Fae courts and she is not accustomed to just how much trickery there is involved. The main difference I would say between this and A Court of Thorns and Roses, one, it's a standalone, so it's much shorter. And on top of that, it's a little less spicy and it's much sweeter. So it is a very romantic, somewhat peaceful, cozy read. And I think if you're in the mood for that, then this one is great. But if you're wanting a little bit more spice, this one's probably not gonna deliver quite on that same level. With Guild, at first glance, this one does not sound like it is similar to A Court of Thorns and Roses, but it's more so in the progression of the character and the arc that she has. So this is actually a King Midas retelling. King Midas, of course, being the individual who could turn things to gold. And so our main character is this golden woman who is essentially a prisoner, but she doesn't really see herself that way, but she is a prisoner to King Midas. She's sort of just there to be this beautiful glowing thing, and he ends up wanting to use her to try and gain some things from some of his political rivals. And that's where it starts out. This first book is basically plotless, <laughs> but the second book I would say, if you're gonna pick up this one, I would recommend reading the first two. I think once you pick it up, you will see what I mean by the character arc is very similar because you see this woman who she feels this strong connection to King Midas. She feels somewhat like she owes so much of the safety that she has to him. And then as she's starting to meet other people, she's starting to see her life a little bit differently before. And then she's starting to see the people that she's interacting with differently and in a different light. I do really want to emphasize though that this one, this story has some very, very graphic scenes. Not all of them are romantic. Not all of them are loving. There are some really difficult to read moments in this in this series. So if you're going to pick this one up, just know it gets quite dark and it definitely gets very adult. Quite the opposite of an enchantment of ravens, which is all cute and wholesome. Switching back to a young adult story, we have These Hollow Vows. This one is probably the most like A Court of Thorns and Roses in its synopsis. So we follow a girl who is living among the humans. She has a sister who she has pretty much been taking care of. And then something happens and now our main character, in order to do what she can to help protect her sister, she ends up going to the Fey land. And there's even the similar character types when it comes to the romantic interests of the character. So far, this first one is the only one that's out in the series, and I believe it's gonna be a duology. The second one is coming out very soon at the time that I'm filming this. So this one is very angsty, 
very tropey, somewhat cliche, but it is so entertaining. It's kind of that cozy, familiar, fun weekend fantasy read. And I definitely think that if you're just looking for that, you're just looking to be entertained, you want to flip the page, you're definitely going to get that. I think there is some of the fun trickster side to the Fae present in this one that I don't feel is as much there in A Court of Thorns and Roses. I feel like the Fae aspects of Akatar are just like, look how sexy we are. And also some of us have wings. And in this, it's there's a little bit more to it. I'll mention the Cruel Prince series here in a little bit. If you've read Cruel Prince, I would say it's like more so that level of how the Fae behave. After that, we have For the Wolf, this one, and its sequel, that would be the completion of the story. So it is a duology. I just recently read it. I do think if you're gonna pick this one up, you don't want to wait really too long between books one and two because a lot of the world building elements play a very big role in the plot line of the sequel. But this story follows two sisters. One is for the throne and one is for the wolf, hence the titles. There are two sisters, one who will fulfill the role of being a leader of their country. She will be the queen, so she is for the throne. And the other one's life is dedicated to being essentially sacrificed to this mysterious being who lives within these somewhat haunted woods known as the wolf. This, you can imagine, gives off the impression that is somewhat of a Little Red Riding Hood story, especially given the way that the cover looks and because it is known as the wolf that's living in this forest. But I would say it heavily leans into Beauty and the Beast as well. And there's those parallels with Akatar because Akatar very much was a Beauty and the Beast retelling. And so when our main character, whose name is Rodaris, another thing, Red, they call her for short, that makes you think Little Red Riding Hood. When Rodaris gets over to the wolf, she starts to uncover that there's so much more going on with this mysterious individual as well as the land that he is living within. This one feels a little bit more grim, almost like a grim fairy tale, but it does have some romantic undercurrents, I would say. The romance is not going to be quite as heavy as it is in Akatar. I think Akatar is more so romance in a fantasy world, where this one I would say is somewhat of a mix between romance and fantasy. And I would say the fantasy elements play a bigger role in book two. So if you do want Akatar with more fantasy, then maybe try this one. I mentioned Cruel Prince a little bit ago. I'm gonna bring that one up now, as well as some other ones where the Fae play a big role in the story. So starting with the Folk of the Air trilogy, also it's been announced that Holly Black is going to be writing more books in this world following one of the characters that is young in this trilogy. I'm assuming they're older in the uh, continuation. So you have that to look forward to if you do like this series. This one, the beginning of the story follows a young teenage girl whose family is harmed and then she is taken into the Fae world by the individual who actually harmed her family. They owed him a debt. But now as a result of what he's done, he feels it is his obligation to raise this girl and her sister. Our main character's name is Jude. She's taken to this Fae world, but because she is human, she's very much looked down upon by the Fae, including by this young man named Cardin. The thing that Jude has over the Fae is that she has the ability to lie and they do not. And so she tries to take advantage of this by becoming a spy for a notable individual within the Fae courts. And this is how she finds her individuality, her agency, and her power. Next up, we have Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik. This very much so is a recommendation because of the fae elements, not really because of the romance, but I really love this book and it's great and you should give it a go. <laughs> Even if you're more so looking for the romance, there's a little bit. This is much smaller of a subplot though than I would say in uh, in Akatar. But regardless, this story is kind of a historical fantasy. Our author is pulling a lot from their Jewish heritage and tying that within the story. And so you see this folklore aspect as well. Our main character, Miriam, is the daughter of a moneylender. And her family, her father is very kind. He's not very good at his job. And so he's not very good at collecting the money that he has loaned to people and then also the interest that is owed to him. And another layer to this is because the family is Jewish, other people, he feels fearful of challenging them, of putting a firm foot down for what he is owed. But at some point, their family is becoming poor, the mother is starting to become sick, and Miriam's like, I've had enough. And so she demands what is owed to them so that she can provide for her family. 
And in gaining interest on what is owed to them, this attracts the attention of the Fae because in their mind, she is turning silver into gold. And they are very intrigued by this because of their relationship with, uh, with silver and gold. And so she has caught their eye and now they want her to fulfill these various tasks. The Fae in this are much more of the atmosphere, they're tied to the weather, their magic is sort of this whimsical fairy tale grim thing. They are less human-like, I would say, than what you find in A Court of Thorns and Roses. They're more mysterious and their culture and their ways about them are hard to pin down. And so Miriam's trying to balance her everyday life alongside the Fae and trying to also, if you, what I talked about with Cruel Prince, if you like the way that Jude has to try to take what they say and really decide what they're saying and play around with the wording, Miriam has to do that in this as well. This is adult fantasy where Cruel Prince was young adult. This one is much less of an angsty story, I think as a result, especially of the romantic subplot being less prevalent. However, there are also a lot of other perspectives that you get in this, more so than I anticipated when I picked it up initially. And the other perspectives touch on some very challenging things. You have one woman who is within the nobility and how she is trying to gain power and how that ties to Miriam is, I think, very interesting to explore. There's also a young woman who does not have the most loving, supportive home. She has to deal with a lot of violence within her life. And you see the ways that these... I always describe it as the ways in which these women are all kind of quietly finding ways to be powerful. It's a great book. I absolutely love it. Next, we have Deal with the Elf King. It is Elven and not Fae, but there is a sequel that has to do with Fae. There are Fae in this particular story. And the way that this series is set up is they all take place within the same fantasy world, but each of the individual books are standalones, which I think is kind of a fun way to approach a fantasy series. So regardless, this first one, I do think there are some parallels to A Court of Thorns and Roses. This one is a hint sweeter. It's a standalone, so the story is complete after this first book. And there are some intimate scenes. So there's a, a little bit of spice for those of you that like the spice. We follow a young woman who is living among the humans, I'm kind of on repeat here. And then she is whisked off to the elven world because she is supposed to fulfill something that it's kind of known to balance out the magic between where the humans are and where the elves are. She then becomes the bride to the elven king. And at first they are definitely butting heads. It's sort of an enemies to lovers sort of setup. I know a lot of people love that trope. And so if you like that trope, just immediately I'm going to say, give this one a go. I do think there's something about it that has more of a wholesome nature to it. I did really like our main character. I thought she was very compassionate, but also very good at putting her foot down and standing up for not only herself, but those she cares about or the things that she finds important. Really quick, this probably goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you're a fan, of A Court of Thorns and Roses. You know, there's the Throne of Glass series, also by Sarah J. Mass, has her familiar angst. The last five, I still have five more books to mention, they are not quite as similar in plot line, but there is just something about these that I think is worth giving a go because I do think there's some overlap between the fans of Sarah J. Mass and the people who have enjoyed these books. So the next one I'm going to mention is one of my favorite books of all time. The love story is really beautiful. It's kind of insta-lovey, but I still think that the love story is, is so sweet. And the story itself, the themes are about compassion and also about trauma, PTSD. It is a beautiful story. I will say it takes a while to get going and it is very strange. It's very different. So if you're looking for something a little bit more on the unique side, I think this one is a good one. And also the writing style. I'm not usually a fan of flowery writing, but gosh darn it, can Lainey Taylor write some pretty things? <laughs> and that would be, finally, talking about what it is, Strange the Dreamer. So this story follows a young man. Most of these follow women. This follows a young man named Laszlo Strange. His whole life, he has been obsessed with a place called Weep. And at some point, everybody went from believing Weep was real to believing it was just this story of this make-believe place. But Laszlo 100% thinks it is real. And he's 
looking through every single book he can to find out more about it. He's learned the language of Weep, even though everybody else believes it's fictional. He's like, no, I swear it's real and someday I'm gonna find it. And then one day he has an opportunity to find out for sure if Weep is indeed real. And while we have that plot line, we also have another perspective introduced. And this other perspective I always describe as, uh, they are blue, they are with some other people who are blue, and you have no idea what's going on with them. It is unlike anything else I've ever read. It is a duology, so there's two books. This is another one where if you pick up the first one, make sure you have time to pick up the second. It leaves off with such a cliffhanger. Like, it's like the story just got cut in half. I do understand why it cut off where it did, because once you start the second one, you're gonna be like, what am I reading? Because it seems like you're reading about completely different people, and it feels like you're suddenly reading a different genre. And if you pick it up, you'll see what I mean. But the way it all ties together is heartbreaking, but beautiful. And it really is just unlike anything else. The themes are, they're great. Next one I'm recommending purely because I think that the amount of fantasy to romance, the ratio, I just think that it's a nice balance and it's a similar balance to what you get in A Court of Thorns and Roses, although I think this one might be more political, and that would be The Bridge Kingdom and its sequel, Traitor Queen. So this is a series where the first two books are somewhat of a completed story, but you will be following other characters later in the series. I believe it's a projected six book series, maybe even more. But in this one, you follow two main perspectives. These are the love interests. It's got the enemies to lovers trope. And we follow a woman who has been trained her whole life to potentially fulfill a marriage alliance with a kingdom that hers is often, I wouldn't say at war with all the time. They have had war before, but they are often somewhat more enemies than they are friends. And so her father wants her to marry the king of this country and then essentially spy for him. Lara, her whole life has been told that they are terrible, they deserve this, they mistreat their people because of their selfishness and their greed. Her own people suffer as a result of the kinds of things they do with trade. When she gets there though, it's not quite what she expected. And then the other perspective, Aaron, is very suspicious of her. He's not like some doofus who's like, oh wow, a pretty woman I'm married to, yay. He's like, this girl's for sure gonna report to her dad. So that makes her job harder. She's trying to prove that she's innocent even though she's not. He believes that she is up to something, but he can't help but find her to be compelling and interesting. And the way that she tries to help his own people really starts to affect him. and. You see these two characters come together. It is very politically driven, but I do think that the romance, like I was saying, the way it's balanced in with the story, I think you will like if you like Akatar. The next couple are just so angsty and fun and entertaining that I wanted to mention them in case you're just like, I just need, I need that angsty feel. And so that would be The Shadows Between Us by Trisha Levenseller and also Ash Princess by Laura Sebastian. So Trisha Levenseller, I have said before, is just such a great author for if you're looking for something sweet and cozy. I especially really like Warrior of the Wild for that. That book is just the cutest. This though is essentially following a villainous woman. So we follow this woman who has decided that she is going to try and seduce the king so that he will marry her and then she'll just kill him and then she'll just be queen and she'll have all his power. And that's her plan. And it turns out he's just perhaps as selfish as she is and she's sort of met her match. And the two of them are very wicked. So it's kind of enemies to lovers, but it's also like villains to lovers. <laughs> and it's just fun and ridiculous. Ash Princess, the synopsis does not make it seem like it would be entertaining. It actually sounds like it would be very sad and there are sad elements to it, but I think the trilogy as a whole is just an absolute page turner. So you follow this young woman who her family was conquered, her kingdom was conquered, and she was of the ruling family. They killed everyone in her family but her. They have kept her alive to be used against her own people if they try to rebel. So if her people try to rebel, they will publicly harm her and she just has an absolutely miserable life. You can see why I said it doesn't sound like it would be entertaining. But the beginning of the story is Theodosia deciding, I've had enough. I'm no longer going to be a pawn against my people. And so that's where the story starts. 
And so she's trying to kind of maneuver with court politics. This carries on into the second one as well. And then I was actually really surprised by how emotionally gripped I was by the third book because I did always kind of go into this one being like, I'm ready to be entertained. This is a great break between all these epic fantasy series like Storm My Archive and things. And then by the end, I was like, gosh darn it, if I am not really sad about some of the things that are happening. The last story I'm gonna mention, one, it is up there in popularity, two, the writing style. I actually really like the way that this author, Saba Tahir, it writes. And I think that the connections between the characters, this sort of sweeping story, I just think that if you like Akatar, you might like this one too. So the series would be an ember in the ashes. The first one, it's somewhat Roman inspired. We follow a young woman who is a part of this somewhat oppressed group of people. Something happens to her brother at the beginning of the story. And then in her efforts to try to find her brother to get more information, she ends up becoming a spy for another group of people. And we have another character who is a part of the higher class and they are training. You have them and their best friend who are just trying to become the most elite of soldiers. And you see this character and Laia is the girl. So you have Elias and Laia. You see them sort of, their worlds collide and then it takes off from there. There is actually one more I'll mention and that would be from Blood and Ash. A lot of people who like Sarah J Mass do end up liking Jennifer L. Armentrout's stories as well. That one follows a young woman who has for religious reasons, been kept essentially in isolation her whole life. And then she ends up developing a relationship with somebody who is guarding her. And then she starts to kind of explore her own desires while trying to also protect her kingdom from any potential harm that prophecies have spoken of. So that's from Blood and Ash. That's it for some recommendations for if you like A Court of Thorns and Roses, maybe check out all of these. If you have any of your own recommendations, I'll have a pinned comment so that you can leave your recommendations as well. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you all later. Bye.